Let's take a look at command line basics, displaying a calendar of the current month. At the command line, there is a simple command that you can use to display a calendar of the current month, cal. Let's take a look at command line basics, displaying the current date and time. At the command line, there is a simple command that you can use to display the current date and time, the date command. Let's take a look at command line basics, PWD. PWD is one of the simple commands that you need to learn. PWD stands for Print Working Directory. This command gives us the location where we're currently located in the directory structure. Let's take a look at the manual page. PWD prints the name of the current working directory. There are a couple of options which you usually won't need to use. When we run PWD currently, we see that I'm in my home directory. We can explore other places in the file system and use PWD to identify where we are. Let's use the CD command to go somewhere else. Let's try a few more. You'll see that wherever I go, I can use PWD to find out the location where I am. Let's take a look at command line basics, using exit to end a terminal session. When you are done at the command line, it is good practice to explicitly terminate your bash terminal session. This is done using the command exit. After you execute this command, your bash session ends. If you were connected to a remote server via SSH, as I was here, executing the exit command also terminates your SSH session. Let's take a look at command line basics, using up and down arrow keys to navigate the command history. Let's begin by running a few simple commands. We'll start by running a command to see the current date and time. Next, we'll print a simple message. And next, let's display a calendar of the current month. When working at the command line, it is likely that you may want to run a command again. Bash provides a simple me mechanism for navigating the commands that you have used recently, the up arrow and the down arrow. Pressing the up arrow will instruct Bash to recall the previous command from the list of recently used commands. Let's try pressing the up arrow. As you can see, the most recently used command now appears. Let's try pressing the up arrow again. The next most recently used command, which in this case was echo, now appears. Let's try pressing the up arrow again. 
the next most recently used command, which in this case was date, now appears. Just as we can use the up arrow to navigate backwards in time through the command history, we can also use the down arrow to navigate forwards in time through the command history. Let's try pressing the down arrow. Doing so takes us forward one command to the echo command. Let's try pressing the down arrow again. Doing so again takes us forward one command, this time to the cal command. And finally, let's press the down arrow one more time. Doing so takes us back to an empty command line. This corresponds with where we were before we first pressed the up arrow. Let's take a look at command line basics, using left and right arrow keys to navigate within the current command. Let's begin with a command that displays a simple message. After entering this command, what can I do if I want to change what I just typed? One option would be to delete what I typed using the backspace key. And then type something else. However, there is a more efficient option. By using the left and right arrow keys, I can navigate backwards and forwards within the command as I type. Let's take a look at command line basics, makedir. Makedir is used to create directories. After using makedir to create a directory, we can use the ls command to verify that that directory was successfully created. Let's try again. This time, let's ask, let's ask makedir to be verbose. By calling makedir with the dash v flag, makedir prints a message for each created directory. We can, of course, still use ls to verify that the directory was created. Makedir can also be used to create multiple directories at one time. If you attempt to create a directory and a directory with that name already exists, Makedir will produce an error message. In the previous examples, we created directories directly within the current working directory. It is also possible to use Makedir to create directories elsewhere. This command creates a subdirectory called edu inside the src directory. This behavior can be extremely useful. However, be advised that if the parent directory does not exist, Makedir will produce an error message and will fail to create the subdirectory. This command failed because the examples directory doesn't exist. There's a solution. Let's take a look at the manual for Makedir to find it. The dash p flag instructs Makedir to make parent directories as needed.
The dash py can also be used so that Maker doesn't complain if the directory already exists. Recall that we already created a directory called bin. As we saw earlier, if we try to create a directory that already exists, Maker will normally fail. But by calling Maker with the dash p flag, Maker will silently succeed. In all of the examples so far, we've asked Maker to create directories within the current working directory. We can alternatively call Maker using absolute paths. Maker is an essential Linux command that you will use frequently. You should practice using it to create directories in your current working directory and elsewhere. While you may never use the dash Z or dash M flags, you should learn to use the dash P flag. Let's take a look at command line basics. Using ls to list the contents of the current working directory. ls is one of the most commonly used commands. Let's take a look. If I run ls with no arguments, it will display the contents of the current working directory. We can now see that this directory contains five other directories. Baz, Foo, Homework, CanLM, and Zork. Let's navigate to another directory. And use ls to view its contents. We can now see that the current working directory, CanLM, contains a number of files and directories. Now, let's use cd to change to a different directory. Now, if I run ls with no parameters, it's going to print the contents of the current working directory, which is slash user. In conclusion, invoking ls with no parameters will display the contents of the current working directory. Let's take a look at command line basics using less to view text files. When working at the command line, it is likely that you will commonly want to view the contents of various files you were working with. There are a number of programs you can use to accomplish this goal. One of the most widely used programs for viewing text files is less. Like many programs you will encounter, the name less is a play on words. Less was developed as a more fully featured replacement for an earlier text viewing application whose name is more. Less can be used to view the contents of text files. Notice that unlike on Windows, on Linux, file extensions such as .md, .txt, .zip, and .py are not meaningful. Even though readme.md has an extension, it is still a plain text file and can be opened by less.
less can be navigated page up and page down using various key shortcuts, including space to page forward and B to move backwards. To exit less, press Q. Less has lots of options. One helpful option is the display of line numbers. This option can be enabled with the dash N flag. Notice that if necessary, Less will wrap lines if the line is too wide to be viewed on the current display. Line 10 in this file begins here, but continues through here. This line is marked as line 10 throughout. Let's take a look at some other files. Here is George Washington's inaugural address. And here is Johnson's. And here is Obama's. The text files don't have to be in English. Less is capable of displaying text in other languages. For example, here's a Swadesh list for Russian. Less can also open more than one file at a time. When using less to view multiple files, the command colon n is used to navigate to the next file. And the command colon p is used to navigate to the previous file. Less is one of the most commonly used programs you will encounter when using the command line. It is well worth your while to learn how to use it and to learn some of its more commonly used shortcuts. Let's take a look at command line basics. Using ls to list the contents of a non-current directory using a relative path. 
Let's take a look. If I run ls with no arguments, it will display the contents of the current working directory. ls also accepts an argument. When I provide an argument to ls, it will list the contents of that directory rather than the current directory. So, here we see that there are a number of files and directories within the CanLM directory. If we want to see the contents of one of these subdirectories, one approach would be to use cd to navigate to that subdirectory and then use ls to view its contents. However, there is a faster way. Let's go back to the home directory and try the faster way. Rather than calling cd and then calling ls, we can directly call ls, providing the directory as an argument. In the above invocation of ls, we provided a relative path, canlm slash include, as an argument to ls. After doing so, ls listed the contents of the specified directory. We can also call ls using other relative paths, including those that make use of dot and dot dot. Recall that dot dot refers to the parent of the current working directory. In this case, the parent of the current working directory is canlm. Let's try another. In this case, dot dot refers to the parent of the current working directory, canlm, and dot dot slash util refers to the util directory that is within the canlm directory. Let's take a look at command line basics using ls to list the contents of a non-current directory using an absolute path. Let's take a look. If I run ls with no arguments, it will display the contents of the current working directory. ls also accepts an argument. When I provide an argument to ls, it will list the contents of that directory rather than the current directory. So here we see that there are a number of files and directories within the canlm directory. If we want to see the contents of one of these subdirectories, one approach would be to see, use cd to navigate to that subdirectory and then use ls to view its contents. However, there is a faster way. Let's go back to the home directory and try the faster way.
rather than calling cd and then calling ls. We can call ls directly, providing the directory as an argument. In the above invocation of ls, we provided an absolute path, slash home, slash lane s, slash ken lm, slash include, as an argument to ls. Let's take a look at command line basics, identifying and understanding symbolic links. Let's take a look. So far, everything looks normal. User bin python is a file. More specifically, we can use this file to invoke the Python interpreter. Let's look more closely at this file. In the above invocation of ls, we used the dash l flag to direct ls to use the long listing format. Notice that in this long listing, there is an arrow. The arrow means that user bin python is not a regular file. Instead, it is a symbolic link that points to another file. In this case, user bin python points to the file python 2.7. We can confirm that user bin python is a symbolic link by invoking the program file. File can be used to determine the type of a file. This confirms that user bin python is a symbolic link. Let's take a look at user bin python 2.7. We see now that user bin python 2.7 is an actual executable file. So, when we call python, the system redirects our call so that python 2.7 is called instead. Now, Let's look at a slightly more complex example. We see that user bin emacs is a symbolic link to Etsy alternatives emacs. Okay, that's a little strange. Normally executable files are located in user bin, not in Etsy. Let's take a look at Etsy alternatives emacs. We see now that we have another symbolic link. Etsy Alternatives Emacs 
is actually a symbolic link to user bin emacs24x. So, when we run user bin emacs, the system redirects our call twice. First, to Etsy Alternatives Emacs, and then finally to user bin Emacs 24x. In conclusion, symbolic links like shortcuts in Windows and aliases in the Mac OS provide a mechanism for referring to another file. Symbolic links can be easily identified by using ls with the dash l flag, and also by using the file command. Let's take a look at command line basics, using ls to view hidden files. If I run ls with no arguments, it will display the contents of the current working directory. We can see now that this directory contains five other directories Baz, Foo, Homework, CanLM, and Zork. However, this directory actually contains a number of other hidden files. By default, ls ignores any file whose name begins with dot. We can force ls to display these otherwise hidden files by using the dash a flag. As you can see, when we invoke ls with the dash a flag in the home directory, a number of hidden files can be seen. Let's take a look at command line basics using ls with additional options. If I run ls with no arguments, it will display the contents of the current working directory. We can now see that this directory contains five other directories Baz, Foo, Homework, CanLM, and Zork. There are a number of additional options we can use to configure ls. One commonly used option is the dash l flag. The dash L flag causes ls to use a long listing format. Using the long listing format shows us additional information for each file. This information includes the file type, file permissions, the owner, 
and group associated with the file. The file size. The modification date and the file name. The file sizes reported by ls-l aren't particularly readable. By using the dash H flag, LS will report file sizes in a more human readable format. Notice that when we specify multiple flags, we can either list each flag separately or list the flags together. The above two commands are equivalent. There are a number of other useful flags in LS, which can be found by reading through the LS man page. Let's take a look at command line basics. Using rm to delete files and directories. Let's take a look. The rm command can be used to delete files. Let's use rm to delete the file license in the current directory. After using rm, the specified file has been deleted. Note that by default, RM does not prompt you for confirmation. It simply deletes the file. If you use the dash I flag, RM will prompt you for confirmation before it begins deleting files. Let's use RM to delete a file in the foo directory. Because we specified the dash i flag, rm prompted us for confirmation before it deleted the file. Let's see what happens if I say no. rm did not delete the file. Let's try again, and this time we'll say yes to the confirmation.
we can also use the dash v flag to force rm to explain what is being done. Let's try removing another file, this time using the dash v flag. By invoking rm with the dash v flag, rm printed a message confirming that the file was deleted. We can also invoke rm with an absolute path. Now, let's try to use rm to delete the foo directory. What just happened? We called rm. providing foo as the argument for what to delete. And rm failed to delete the directory. Let's look at the man page for rm to see if we can figure out what just happened. By default, rm does not remove directories. To force rm to remove a directory and any contents it might have, we can invoke rm with the dash r flag. In many cases, especially when you are new to the command line, it is advisable to use the dash i or dash capital I flag when invoking rm recursively. Here, we'll use the dash capital I flag. We will also use the dash v flag so that rm will confirm what files it deletes. Let's take a look at command line basics, using cd to navigate to a directory using a relative path. Let's take a look at where we are, the current working directory. Now, let's use ls to view the contents of the current working directory. We can use the bash built-in command cd to change directories. To use cd, we provide the name of the directory into which we wish to navigate. Let's use pwd to verify that we've changed directories. 
Notice that in the above invocation of CD, we only specified the name, Baz. We did not type slash home slash lane s slash baz. This style of referring to a directory by only part of its name shows the use of cd using a relative path. The absolute path in this case would be slash home slash lane s slash bass. The relative path that we used was simply bass. Because we were located in the directory slash home slash lane s, at the time we invoked cd, the part of the path corresponding to the current directory can be omitted through the use of a relative path. There are two special relative path components, dot and dot dot. Dot refers to the current working directory. Dot dot refers to the parent of the current working directory. Let's recall where we are. The current working directory, baz, is located within the directory lane s. We could refer to the parent by its absolute path slash home, slash lane s, or we could refer to it as dot dot. Let's use cd and dot dot to navigate to the parent of the current working directory. Let's practice some more. What just happened? We told cd to navigate to dot. Dot is another name for the current working directory. Consequently, we stayed in the same current working directory. In other words, we didn't go anywhere. What just happened? We were in slash home slash lane s slash foo. We used dot dot twice. From slash home slash lane s slash foo dot dot would refer to the parent directory slash home, slash lane s. But we used the relative path dot dot slash dot dot. If dot dot is the parent, then dot dot slash dot dot is the parent of the parent. In this case, the parent is slash home slash lane s, and its parent is slash home. So, invoking cd dot dot slash dot dot from home lane s foo takes us 
to home. Notice what we just did. We used a relative path, lane s slash ken lm, to navigate from slash home to slash home slash lane s slash ken lm. We could have called CD twice, but this way was faster. Let's go back and see the slower way. We used CD here to navigate one directory at a time. Just as we can use ls to look into subdirectories, we can also use CD to navigate directly into subdirectories. Let's take a look at command line concepts. Understanding complex relative paths using dot and dot dot. Now, let's take a look at one example of a relative path that uses both dot and dot dot multiple times. Now let's go back and take a closer look at this complex relative path. We'll begin by visualizing the directory tree in which we're operating. The directory tree looks like this. For convenience in keeping track of subdirectories, I have color-coded the subdirectories we'll be discussing. The current working directory is slash home, slash lane s, slash ken lm, slash util, slash stream. Notice that I've color coded the names in this path to match the corresponding subdirectories in the directory tree. Now let's look at our complex relative path. Again, Notice that I've color-coded the names in this relative path to match the corresponding subdirectories in the directory tree. Dot dot, which you see here in red, refers to the parent of the current working directory. In our case, 
the parent is the util directory, which is also drawn in red here in the tree. Double conversion is a subdirectory of util. Thus, given that stream is the current working directory, dot dot slash double conversion refers to the subdirectory colored in gold in the tree. Slash home, slash lane s, slash ken lm, slash util, slash double conversion. Dot is another name for the current directory. This means that dot dot slash double conversion slash dot means exactly the same thing as dot dot slash double conversion. The parent of double conversion is util. Thus, dot dot slash double conversion slash dot slash dot dot refers to the red node in the tree whose absolute path is slash home slash lane ls lane s slash ken lm slash util. The parent of util is canlm. So, dot dot slash double conversion slash dot slash dot dot slash dot dot refers to slash home slash lane s slash can lm, which we see colored orange in the tree. lm, which you see in blue, is a subdirectory of can lm. So, dot dot slash double conversion slash dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash lm refers to slash home slash lane s slash ken lm slash lm and because dot which we see here in blue refers to the current directory. Dot dot slash double conversion slash dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash lm slash dot refers also to lm. Wrappers is a subdirectory of LM. So, dot dot slash double conversion slash dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash LM slash dot slash wrappers refers to slash home slash plain S slash Ken LM slash LM slash wrappers. Dot dot, which we see here in blue, refers to the parent of the current working directory.
So this path refers to LM. And finally, builder is a subdirectory of LM. And so, dot dot slash double conversion slash dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash LM slash dot slash wrappers slash dot dot slash builder refers to home lane s kenlm lm builder 